Good. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this special midweek without Mark this week. This is one of our annual programs. For those of you that have been with us for uh, quite a while, thank you for uh, continuing to join us. For those of you that are new, this is our 30th midweek with Mark, although this one without Mark uh, in a row. So we've been having a, a great time with our weekly presentations and having a great time. Uh, we've been offering the Midweek with Marks uh, every Wednesday at three, and we do a very special one next week uh, already planned. And that one has been retitled. It's Midweek with Bryce, because Bryce Lane is gonna be our guest speaker for the day. And his title is 10 Tips for Better Gardening, uh, St Southern Style. And for those of you that attended our um, Gardening in the South program, that might sound a little familiar, and that is because it is familiar. That is the same title he used for Gardening in the South, but is this not gonna be the same presentation? We had time limits in place for uh, Gardening in the South, so he was not able to finish his top 10 uh, tips. So he'll be doing the presentation reverse order. So if you attended, this is your chance to catch up and uh, uh, find out what the uh, last tips were that he had. He's also promised to to add more tips. He didn't give me a number, so I just kept up with the top 10 tips for uh, uh, for gardening Southern style. So it's gonna be uh, mostly a new presentation. So hope you can join us at that time. Again, it's gonna be Wednesday, uh, October 28th at 3 p.m., just as usual. Uh, today's program is um, a special one. This is gonna be questions and answers with the JCRA staff. And we have a, a good number of staff here today. Uh, we of course have Tim Alderton and Douglas Ruhren, who are our horticulturalist here at the Arboretum. But we also have Dennis Carey, who's our uh, database manager. We have Arlene Calhoun, who is our assistant director. We have Catherine Wall, who is our volunteer and membership coordinator. And of course, myself, I'm the programs and education coordinator. And I think I saw Ann Swallow on here, didn't I, Ann? Uh, going through the list. Yep, there's Ann Swallow. Ann Swallow is there you go. Ann Swallow is the assistant for um, for Dennis and helps him out with quite a bit of things. And many of us are horticulturists as well, although some of us are just really active home gardeners, which is pretty darn awesome. So we're all here to help answer your questions. You are more than welcome to come on in through using your voice uh, because this one's going to be very interactive. I'm not going to bother muting anyone this time around unless something really starts to happen. Then I'll then I'll go ahead and do that because we do want this session to be more more interactive. So turn on your video feeds, turn on your microphones, you're good to go. Uh, if we have a, um, a lack of questions, uh, we have some show and tell to do as well. So send us your questions either by just asking them verbally or yeah, there you go. There's some of Doug's samples or ask them in the chat. And in fact, I think I may have seen at least one already come in the chat. Um, okay, so let's see what we have here. Okay, I think First of all, some of them were just people talking. Let it go. So let's see. I have a couple questions too. I'll throw there to you. One is some of the plants that we're picking up um, in the next week or so from the plant sale. Are those ones that you would recommend going ahead and, and planting in the ground still? Um, the ones that were in that plant sale, or are they ones that like you recommend holding on to till next spring? Uh, that's going to vary depending on what they are. Um, I would say for the most part, they're all things that it would be great if you could plant them this fall. There are a few things and we'll advise those who buy those particular plants that it might be best to hold them until the um, spring to plant. The only one that comes to mind and maybe Tim or others of you could think of others. The only one that comes to mind is um, the Syningia eumorpha, which is a half hardy or maybe fully hardy um, Gloxinia. Um, we've had it through two winters. They weren't very trying winters. So we're, we feel it would be best to grow it as a house plant this winter and then plant it in the spring. And that's a tuberous forming species. So it may go dormant even in the house and you can probably dry it off if you'd ever grown the Florisox Gloxinia. It should be very similar care to that. Or even some of the other syningias that we grow here, I've kept them dry through the winter. Uh, I'm an apartment and I've kept, um, I think Cherry's Jubilee last winter in, in a closet, a storage closet I have. Just happy <laughs> to clam, just kept it dry, put it back, uh, repotted it in the spring and it, it flushed right out, so. I'm, I'm guessing a, a garage would work as well too, a nice it's cool, but- freezing. 
not below freezing. Yeah. Okay. And Thank maybe you. on a related on a related note, Doug and Tim, uh, Beth asked about the mangaves that she got at the annual plant uh, distribution early this year. What's I would best keep for them those? inside for the the winter? There's a couple that might have some hardiness to them, but the majority of them are going to be tender um, unless we have a really mild winter. Yeah, I don't disagree with Tim's answer, but um, I'm always pressed for room for my house plants. So my desert cactus, I leave on a very sunny screen porch all winter long, except when we go below 28. And I think any, Tim, would you, wouldn't you say that all those mangaves would tolerate probably? Down oh yeah, there? yeah. I had one, I have one and I kept it out for quite some time. I think I have made a yeah. steel at home in a container. And I think I just brought, I brought it in when we had some really cold nights. Yeah, but otherwise, I my leave porch my, otherwise. Yeah, otherwise I leave my desert cactus in an unheated, sunny screen porch all winter. I haven't kept mangaves in the garage, but I did keep agave in the garage. And that have been perfectly fine, even though they weren't even in a window. That was the uh, um, agave lofantha, the quadricolor that I gave the Arboretum early this year. And they seem to do pretty good. So I'm, I'm gonna put the mangaves in, in that yeah, same they'll spot. Yeah, they'll, they'll just hold themselves all winter, even if you don't water them, uh, even when there's a low light. Yep. So um, you're not encouraging the grow, keep them a little cooler. Uh, and they just both in stasis. They're not doing. They're not growing. They're not. Um, uh, but they're not going to shrink too much. And they'll. Um, they typically won't even get too etiolated. So, I had a, a few mangave in my southern facing window, and they they wanted to grow, and yeah. they kind of stretched in and um, weren't perfect, but they weren't bad. So I, I I was trying to think about using the garage this year, just so they would go more into stasis and just hang out and not do much. And they are very forgiving. Um, yeah. They're much faster growing than a, a, a plain agave. So in the spring, if they've gotten damaged, they look kind of sad. They will recover quickly uh, once you put them outside in the sun. Oh yeah, whether it's dead. in the ground or in a, in a container. Okay. And Nancy just said that she has an eight-foot-tall castor bean, and <laughs> it doesn't want to produce any seeds. And she's wondering what's going on. Anything that she can do? That sounds wonderful to me. I hate the seeds. They, come up, they can be rather weedy if they set speed. I do love the foliage, though. Um, when we used to have them at the garden in the garden here, I would actually go and cut the seed heads off so they wouldn't set fruit. Um, and and that's why late. we don't have any more because Tim, <laughs> all of them. It took me a good ten to fifteen years, or ten or, 10 or twelve years to get rid of them. <laughs> I haven't had castor bean in, in a couple of decades, but I remember growing them in Texas, and I don't remember even in that longer growing season over there that they really flowered at all. So I don't know. Um, it seems like they were just wanting to be more actively growing and making big leaves, where if they maybe suffered and had lower fertility and, and uh, lower moisture, that they would have gone to that seed. Could be the I don't know. Not stressing them enough. I'm in Brunswick County, and I planted one about two months ago and I'm on the intercoastal waterway and I had about three and a half feet of water from Isaias so a lot of my yard went south but um the castor bean is probably five feet tall blooming everyone keeps asking me who I'm wanting to kill wow <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah there's no there's antidote for that, chemi that chemical so yeah there, there's your secret to having a flower Nancy just have a hurricane come through and dump three and a half feet of water right. in your yard <laughs> Just kidding. De definitely don't do that. Um, luckily, you can uh, get some seed fairly inexpensively and, and grow a few out every, every year for that plant. It would be nice to harvest seed, but uh, at least it's not too hard to find. Okay, let's see what Penelope said. She says that she has a spirea uh, bridal valve. It's very large now. Should I divide it to maintain it uh, uh, flowering? Uh, it is so large that I need to prune it greatly to manage any effort to divide it. Please advise. This might be a good one for Doug because the renewal printing. Yeah. yeah, people don't often think of dividing shrubs, but it's something you can certainly do with the typical shrub like a spirea that has so many stems. Um, and if it's a really old plant, it might have sort of already sort of gone in separate directions and there might be separate plants. Um, if it's one that's gone years and years without any pruning, uh, next 
spring or late winter, you could cut the whole thing to the ground or maybe wait till after it's done blooming and cut it to the ground and just let it start all over. But um, they're very tolerant of hard pruning. If you do do regular renewal pruning on it, that helps a lot of shrubs like that from getting big as they would if you didn't prune them at all. <clears throat> And Miriam said that she had a new landscape installed um, fairly recently, I guess it was last year, including a rain garden and pollinator plants. And she's had a lot of die off, unfortunately, including a weeping cherry that was doing well through July and then just suddenly died. And I had a similar thing. I think mine was a Kwanzaa cherry and it leafed out in the spring, flowered. And before the flowers even had a chance to uh, naturally die, the whole entire plant just <laughs> How old All, were they? Uh, what, Tim? How old was it? It was a it was a fully established plant. I had been here for a few years, and the previous owner did, but it wasn't ancient. It only had like a, a caliper that big, and it, it it checked out for no apparent reason at all. So, and, and I didn't even really see any diseases on it. But cherries certainly can have some of their own problems, unfortunately. The weeping cherry. Um... It, it it died in July and so it had flowered and it had grown quite well for a while and it's in a bed where everything else is extremely happy so it was it didn't you know it didn't dry out um, so that was why it was a mystery but I know if, if your cherry is anything like some of the cherries in my neighborhood that we have there there are weeping cherries that haven't had a leaf on them since August but yeah. they're they leaf oh. out the next spring they they just go. They just go dormant uh, prematurely. Um, and most of them, if I'm not mistaken, are weeping cherries that I, I see are totally naked. In fact, I think I was walking by one the other day that had a few flowers coming on it already. We have a little one in the garden that looks like that right now. Some of the um, flowering uh, crab apples and weeping cherries will often do that. Uh, they'll get foliar diseases and all the leaves will drop off, but the plant is still alive. I hope so. <laughs> yep. Scratch so, the bark on the twigs and you might be able to tell if, if it's green, uh, there's a good yep. chance that it'll come back out. It was, I haven't looked recently. How about ornamental apricot trees? They look- Mine's not looking so healthy either. <laughs> they're much the same way. It's, a, it's, a, it's next akin to the cherries or prunus. Uh, they don't look that pretty at this time of the year uh, very, very often, but how old is your tree too? Uh, probably somewhere between five and eight years. Okay. Maybe five years. Um, I'd say on average for us, they're going to live about 15 to 20 years um, uh, in our area. So, I mean, even eight, not terrible, um, but they can look really shabby after a few years. They'll sometimes get boars, had them do that in the garden and that yeah. can take them out. We actually had to take one out um, called Josephine a few, uh, about two years ago. Um, we were able to get cuttings of it and we have some in the nursery, but um, that was due to boars on it and it, they slowly die back and they look a little uglier. They grow fairly quickly, so you can replace them. Um, because Is there any danger in a disease sort of transmitting through the soil or anything if you do you that? You might not want to have it right in the same place at the, uh, for a year or two after that. Uh, the soil, I don't think it's going to be as much of an issue if it's boars, which tends to be, at least has been here in the garden, has been a boar issue. Um, so if it's soil, that would be a fungal issue more than likely. It has this black crud that's growing on the branches. Is that That sounds like boars. Boars? Or like the insect borers? Black Wait, knot. They're... She might have black knot on. That's through. the other thing, yeah, which is a fungal and it affects the branches. So it's Lovely black knot? Knot. Knot. Yeah. Knot. K-N-O-T. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So should you, you would suggest I just take it out? Uh, I haven't had to deal with that. Where do you live? Chapel Hill. Yeah. It's more of a problem over that direction than it is here in Raleigh. So um, Doug, did you say that uh, Tom Kroninsky had to remove a lot of his due to that? Oh yeah. He had, he had a big plantings of Prunus Mumi out in Chatham County and um, he got real heavy black knot on them. So removed the trees. It's uh -huh. Common on our native uh, choke cherry, mm. uh, and um, 
there's I don't think there's any treatment if it when it just starts to get it you can prune out those few stems but when you get a whole lot of it it's probably best just to remove the whole plant I think it's crossed over <laughs> so okay. is the best way to just sort of cut it off and then sort of yank it out of the ground sort of thing I've never had to deal with that sort of issue it's I wouldn't about worry this big oh. Well, if it's that small, yeah, you could yank it out of the ground, but I don't think that it's a problem with the root system. It's just a disease of the twigs. Yeah. So if I cut it back, it would sort of maybe regenerate or, or not? It, it should. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I'll try that. I've never liked the shape of it anyway, so that's my... Yeah, they're kind of awkward. <laughs> yeah. Kind of smooth mummy is not a graceful plant. Right. That, that comment alone might uh, give you good direction what you want to do with the plan. Yeah, so the question <laughs> is what to put there instead. <laughs> they're wonderful for those few weeks in December, January, or February when they're in flower, but the rest of the year they're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you think about persimmons? Oh, I mean, I like them other than they tend to, they like to sucker. Uh, that is, the American persimmon likes to form colonies, clonal colonies, and mm -hmm. that can be problematic in the landscape. But, um, uh, the foliage on them in the fall can be beautiful. Uh -huh. Well, and the Asian ones are often often grafted on our native uh, yeah. persimmons, so you get the suckers from the native one around the uh, Asian cultivar. Ah. Oh, I saw a nice one at Southern States that said it would grow to 18 feet, maybe, or it seems shorter than the other native one. It might be one of the Asian eight. ones. Yeah. That it's grown for fruiting. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of Asian ones that aren't grown for fruiting. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. We've got, we've got another question in the chat. Tim and Doug, Kathy would like to know: Is it better to top dress with compost in a woodland garden in the fall or spring? Whenever you have the time and you have the access to the compost. Exactly. You're going to get a nice layer of leaves though here in the next few weeks, so you might be able to put it off till uh, doing additional to spring if you wanted to. The uh, or you, um, that is, the leaves might settle on their own. You might not have to do anything. Or you could mulch after the leaves, so just after the leaves have fallen, and use that to hold the existing leaves in place. You just wouldn't want them to be built up around the base of a, a trunk of a tree. I was thinking uh, overall winter could be a good time just because a lot of the plants are not going to be up and about and exactly. getting in your so it might be easier when they're not there. So late fall, winter, early spring for many, unless it's a big hellebore beds and yeah, something like that. Yeah, you'll need like a lot that. of your vernal herbs, um, your vernal flowers, your wildflowers that might be, um, hadn't pushed up yet. So you wouldn't have to deal with walking around them. Okay. And another Kathy would like to know, when's a good time to prune a gardenia that flowers in spring and the fall? She's doing it to reduce the size slightly. Uh, Dennis answered that question earlier, and I agree with um, oh. his answer that um, uh, I, I didn't after see it, it blooms in the spring or early summer, and then I'll have time to regrow. I think if you did it now, it might, what did it now, it might induce uh, new growth, which could get damaged. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Mary Ann has asked about a cutting that she's done of hydrangea limelight. It's just getting its first root. She wants to know if she can plant it outside before frost or try to win overwinter it indoors. I think she should leave it in whatever it's rooting and overwinter it outdoors. But it, I think it's far too small to plant in the ground right now. Yeah. I, I, I think maybe a little bit of good news is that's a pretty yeah. tough plant and I'm, I'm hoping that it should do well. I, I would think so. And, and if not, Marianne, I always do one uh, earlier in the year, like May or June for that one. I got one, I, um, one of the limelights and it was probably about two feet tall. It was a fairly healthy looking shrub and I had voles that came and ate the roots and I think I've saved it. It's got new growth and doing well, but it's it's not, you know, it's, it's been in the ground for about, um, I would say three months now. Um, so would you recommend just leaving it there? It's, um, since it does have new healthy growth on it, even though it's very young and it seems to be, you know, it's been established over the summer. 
I would probably just leave it there unless you're really having problems with the voles that as long as they don't come back and have another dinner. I got some, um, it's a type of perlite, but it almost looks like little um, gravelly type of texture of perlite. And it seems to be helping. I've been putting that around anything. I have a new, so my garden beds, I created all of this um, April, March, April, May. Uh -huh. um, brand new. And it's very muddy, mucky, like clay soil. I had just a ton of infestation bug problems this year and just problems with just because of the damp, wet soil with the rainy season and whatnot. But I have put now like about seven cubic yards of 50-50 um, soil added to it and keep adding all these things to it. So I'm, I'm hoping that they'll, everything's going to survive the winter and not get a lot of root rot. That'll help in the long term. And add any organic material you can, more or less, to break up that clay. Kathy, Kathy has asked, how late can she plant Magnolia grandiflora or a crepe myrtle? If, they're, if she's talking about planting from a container as opposed to digging up and transplanting it, I would say you can plant it all year round. Mm -hmm. And I think the I myrtles, think so too. it won't hurt them at all, even if you have to dig them. But the magnolia would, uh, won't, it might, they don't like to get their roots messed with a whole lot. So again, like Doug said, if it's container grown, no problem. I wouldn't do it bald and burlap I, necessarily now. I, I remember reading somewhere that crepe myrtle is one of the few plants that you can actually ball and burlap in the middle of summer in the South, even in Texas, <laughs> and, and it will live. I think Ted <laughs> told me that when he was here. Yeah, they may defoliate yeah, that, and stay uh, twigs for eight to ten months, even, and then all of a sudden finally leaf out. Yeah, it, it must have been Ted. I, I thought <laughs> I, I could imagine that. It was one of the few plants that I remember uh, just along roadsides in Texas where you can see an old uh, home site where the home wasn't even there anymore, and there was still their crepe myrtle. So that that was tough. Charlotte commented that she received one of the Helegias of the Florida Silverbell in the giveaway. She wants to know how to care for it this winter. It's just six inches um, tall right now on a thin, long stem with uh, no leaves. I would plant it in the ground if she could. I can almost see its parent from here if I didn't have cannas in the way. And and if you and if you don't plant in Charlotte, I would go ahead and protect the uh, root mass either with leaves or some other kind of mulch just to keep it from freezing because roots aren't used to freezing over and over in the winter time. Chris is a, a master at this. He's been doing it for years. So <laughs> I have far fewer containerized plants now. Uh, Gwen asked, "When is the best time to uh, propagate uh, her root beer plant that is putting out new shoots now, and what method?" Now would be a fine time as long as you want to inter, um, uh, throw it indoors from cuttings. You could also do it by division, uh, which you might want to wait until spring, I would think, to do that, just when it's a little bit warmer because it is a subtropical uh, plant. But they'll readily root from cuttings. Yeah, we, we often take a bunch of cuttings, you know, a few minutes before our first frost here, just so we have a crop in the spring. And our plant got enormous this year. It did. It did. Okay. Once they're established, they will spread on their own. So give it a, a little bit of space. Because we have ours in an area that... Yeah, not... mine, mine spread. I, I got it from y'all, and it just, it um, probably is eight times the size it started. So it did very well. Yeah, mm -hmm. ours is not in the gra greatest of spot. It's growing underneath uh, one of our great big crepe myrtles, which can be rather dry. It, it tells me when it needs to be watered. It will wilt. But that hasn't inhibited that thing. And it's been there probably six or seven years now. Uh, but the patch has gotten reasonably large. If we had it in a, mo a constantly moist spot, I'd be afraid, actually. I'm glad that we have it in a, a drier spot. How big is it? Uh, it's probably about six or seven feet tall right now. And probably about 10, 12 feet wide patch, I'm going to guess, Doug. At least that wide, yeah. Yeah. Better move mine. <laughs> I, I grew one in a container last year and that thing whether it was wet or not needed water at all times so not a real good container plant they're a good indicator plant you need to start one 
I, I think it was a little too overzealous in telling us that it wanted watering because it, it would just do it first thing in the day, no matter what. Uh, well, Aaron white said, brown hasn't been my problem. <laughs> Aaron said that she's naturalizing an area, a large area of mostly tree roots, sand and rocks with bulbs and seeds that uh, that need the winter and aren't picky about soil quality. What should she be cautious about when putting a thickish layer of soil down in preparation? Is it uh, it isn't really possible to till the soil into the mix with what little soil already exists. Uh, Dennis ahead. answered that earlier and um, made okay. the valid point that you don't put too much soil on top of those tree roots. You you might kill it. You can get away with, what would you say, Tim, an inch or two, but not much more? So you might get a little more than that, but uh, uh, do it gradually would be mm -hmm. a way of doing it over a few years. Uh, I think it'll throw oh, a few more roots up where it can get air still. It's a matter of, I think, suffocating the roots more or less. Yeah, it would. Um, so you wouldn't want to put a foot or more on there. I would say you could probably get two or three inches, which might allow you to get your bulbs planted if they're depending on what type they are. Um, and then are the bulbs already planted and she wants to build up over top them or? Thank you. No, actually, the bulbs are not planted yet. Okay. Then yeah, it, it depends what, what kind of bulbs you're planning on planting. Um, in the areas, tulips, crocuses, the things that naturalize fairly easily. Okay, uh, beware of squirrels. That would all be, be the only thing I say. <laughs> I will put chicken wire down the first year for sure. <laughs> Thank Both you. the ones you mentioned are very edible by squirrels yeah. and voles. So you may want to consider things that are in the amaryllis family like daffodils because or they don't touch them. Uh, Galanthus, uh, Snowdrop, speaking of that, I think Doug has one on his desk. Good to know. Him. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, they this... typically don't touch the Galanthus. Another one that has been really good are Ithion, uh, and they naturalize oh, yeah. very well. Uh, and the, I don't think I've had squirrels actually try to eat them. They're in the onion family, and uh, they're really good. And they're, they flower over a very long period of time. Tulips are candy. <laughs> crocus are too, from what I've heard. A lot of the crocus, especially the spring crocus, I don't have as much trouble with the fall crocuses. Fall uh, and crocus. I'm talking colchicum. Oh, you picked that too? I picked all the flowers in the garden. There's no flowers left in the garden. There, there's more people seeing them here now, Tim, than there would be at the Arboretum. Uh, Nancy has asked, why does her cherry tree attract so many webworms and how does she remove them? <laughs> it's the host plant for the caterpillar. <laughs> yeah. it, it finds it tasty, so that, that's why they're going to get them. And one of the easy ways to remove webworms is to wait in the evening when they all return to their web and cut the branch out. Assuming you can, of course, release the branch out. And if and, you uh, think they haven't covered the whole tree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, get, get them early because as, as they grow up, they do make their webs a lot larger and larger as they keep on going. But that's how we've always done it um, here at my house. And you can open it up and let the birds eat them. Yes, that's a you good can, way yeah. there. Disturb the nest uh, during the day. Thanks, Linda. They're in there. You're welcome. Charlotte commented that she has an agave shira ito no o that she purchased at the Arboretum earlier this June. She planted it in a pot. What's best for this winter? And Charlotte, that kind of goes back to our mangave discussion that we had earlier this year. I don't know how hardy this one is. Does, does Tim or Doug know? It's not reliably hardy in zone seven. It's not or is? It's not. Okay. So yeah, it's a good it's a good container plant, and even if it was hardy, Charlotte, it may not survive the winter outdoors in a container. So I I've brought my agaves into the garage and just left them in there. Don't I don't, haven't watered them at all in the winter time. And uh, when winter starts breaking in in March or or very early April, I'll just put them outside and they're fine. Or like Doug said, we don't have that many cold nights here. If it's above I don't know twenty eight, is that what you suggested, Doug? Yeah. Uh, and if yeah, you're not watering true. them, they tend to be perfectly fine just to bring them in. And if it, it's probably not in a large pot, I'm guessing, because that's a smaller growing one, um, I would just carry it in and out only as you need it. Okay. 
And Gail commented that she planted six oak leaf hollies a year ago. And she said, all of them are green except for one. And one has yellow leaves. What should I do for this one holly? Figure out what's going wrong. Um, like a soil test? One planted too deep. Is it in a wet spot? That, you know, maybe it's lower than the others. Um, Was it pot bound? Same location. <laughs> I, I'm assuming they're all in the same location, but maybe they're not. Yeah. And the Wait, oak, we, oak hollies are supposed to have red new growth, so hopefully they're being green and red. When we moved into this house that I'm at right now, um, the whole front of the house was planted in hollies, and as we got further towards the right side of the house, they weren't doing very well at all, and many of them were yellow, and they were just planted in heavier clay soils and in a drought they were actually sitting in water. And I don't think we even watered them all that much. So it sounds like it's gonna be a soil condition. A soil test would help you with fertility, check to make sure that the uh, drainage is happening around it. And Well, that that's a good point, yeah. Chris, that in, in a place where there's been construction, such as around a house or another building, mm -hmm. the soil might vary tremendously from one spot to another, partly because in some places, due to construction and excavation, you might be dealing with subsoil or maybe they brought in soil to raise the level. And, you know, that soil they brought in might be from multiple different sources. So the soil could be really different from one mm -hmm. location to another. Another thing that we've had yeah, we, in the Arboretum in the Rose play. Garden is a drain. Uh, the soil might be dry or because there's a drain underneath, running underneath that, there could be like a French drain or something. Uh, that you don't even know uh, was down there. And it could be planted on top of that. It sounds okay. environmental. Uh, Charlotte, Charlotte said she bought a sedum sun sparkler wildfire and she put it in a pot and it's not doing well. It looks like maybe a rabbit's been eating it. Move it to our higher location. Will it likely survive? Can it stay outside or in the garage this winter? Sedum should be outside. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't remember the sedum myself, but all of my upright sedums, uh, the deer love. So ones like Autumn Joy and Matrona, some of the taller ones, the, the deer just nibble them down into nothing. So I have to put um, uh, deer repellent on them. And I'm guessing if deer eat them, other things get them, but my ground cover sedums are always fine. Was it, is, is Sun Sparkler a tall one, Doug and Tim or it's Dennis? It's a small one. It's a well, okay. pumper. It's it's a hybrid and it's a bit like um in between AI and or you know it's not really a ground cover one it's a former um it's sort of like a shorter version of autumn joy um more they so they've been slow the first year for us too uh, but the second year they tend to take off well there you go could be uh, waiting for next year. But I would plant it in the ground. I wouldn't keep it in the container. I ha We did have issues with them in the containers, keeping them. They do not like to be in a pot for long term. And uh, Garish has a volunteer flowering plant that needs an ID. Wants to know if he can share a picture of it. I don't know if they're still online, but... Uh, uh, how about if you, um, Tim, you want to put your email address in the um, in the chat and uh, they can send you the photograph of the plant. Does that sound okay? Do that. <laughs> Dennis is, already has his in there. Okay. Oh. Yep. So we can share it amongst if Dennis. So De Dennis also, uh, Dennis's email address is already in there and it Dennis is. likes to share it. So we can go ahead and get to that one in a little bit. So go ahead and share your photograph with Dennis. <laughs> And Carolyn says she wants to move Wolf Eyes Dogwood that is in too shitty of a location. Is there a way I can move it and save it? <laughs> well, we transplanted some rather large things this winter, deciduous shrubs and trees. And we didn't try to dig a nice tidy root ball. Instead, we uh, tried to save as much root as possible. And because they were large, um, we transplanted them bare root. And I think of all the things we transplanted, we only lost one. Uh, so transplant it, but try to preserve as much root and don't worry about 
keeping soil on the root. Bare root is a good way to go once the tree has lost its leaves. Okay, yeah, if so it, I would wait till it's dormant almost. So maybe yes. November, December, January, February in that time frame. Okay, this poor plant has been planted in the wrong location for almost 20 years. Oh, okay. It, and, yeah. the, and, this, and the trunk is only about an inch and a half in diameter. Ooh, I've bad. killed wool fives a couple times, so you're doing well. <laughs> so is it worth moving? <laughs> it could be. If, it grow, if you can make it grow, the, le the foliage display on wolf eye is, is really nice. Well, where should, it where's try. a good place for it? Because obviously I have it in the wrong place. Where do you have it currently? It's very shaded by, uh, it's sort of almost on the north side of the house. Okay, I would give it probably a little bit of shade, but not a dense shade. So just a, a, a light high, uh, high shade probably be better because it is so variegated. I don't Maybe think I should put, put it, it where the apricot was. The, oh, there you go. It's not related <laughs> at all. Probably would have, it shouldn't get that black, um, the black knot disease. So that would be a possibility. Okay, so what can I expect as far as the foliage? I've never seen it do anything. Oh, it's really? never had variegated leaves? Well, I can see the variegated leaves, but that's it. It's typically a really nice white and green variegation. It's, it's consistent. It's not a irregular variegation. Okay. Um, so. Well, and it should so. bloom as well. It should. Yeah. I've never seen a bloom. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's too shady. And always keep in mind that one problem in shade is often that it's very dry. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe. Well, it, it has a lot of competition right there. There's exactly. a lot of trees around it. Exactly. Yeah. So often the problem in a shady location is that they're competing with, uh, you know, great big trees. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Our next one is from Wanda again. She's the lady that had the hurricane come through and in the water surge, her Japanese maple looked fine shortly after, but since then it's dropped its leaves and looks dead. Should I leave it till spring and just see what happens? I would leave it um, for at least, or do a stem, I hate to do it, say it, but a stem scratch. See if the, leaf, the stem is still green uh, and not brittle. Uh, it could be, if they're near the coast, it could be that it could be salt intrusion or just the fact that it was submerged under for a decent amount of time and just did the roots in. But we also deal with a lot of the Japanese maples here will lose their leaves in late summer. Um, and they'll sometimes reflush. So could be because of that as well too. It might not be the stressors of the storm. I wouldn't give up on it quite yet, is what I'm saying basically. Thanks. And I got a private question. Um, someone asked, when is the best time to plant transplant majestic sunflower? I don't know majestic sunflower myself, so I was hoping someone else did. I've never heard of such a thing. No, nor have I. What was that? Sunflower. It is a tr is it a sunflower? He just yes. said majestic sunflower. Yeah, it's a tall, like about six, seven feet tall, but it doesn't have the huge blooms. It's got okay, it's a it's a perennial sunflower. Is it yes. Max Miliani? Is it could be, I don't know the proper okay. name of it. Is Helianthus Maxim Maximiliana it has long sickle shape, sort of slightly recurved, slightly gray, very rough leaves and flowers maybe about three inches across. Yeah, two to three inches. Correct. The flowers. Yes. Uh, you could probably move that anytime you want or need. Oh, sure. It's indestructible. Yes. They tend to, if they're really happy, they will form a large colony. I've grown that one from seed back home in Pennsylvania. And it, it, I think my mom still has it and she doesn't do anything to it, but it is an indestructible plant is right. Good. Well, it's blooming now. I thought I'd wait till after exactly. it blooms. That would be a perfect time after it's done flowering through. I mean, you could probably move it through June and you'd still get flowers next fall, you know. Right. Thank you. Okay. And Barb has asked, how can she get rid of gallium? And she put in parentheses cleavers in my woodland garden without losing my woodland flowers is it the perennial gallium or is it an annual one that, i've never well, heard of cleavers before. yeah cleavers is another common name for bed straw the velcro plant um cleavers oh. is an old name um for, for that winter annual um uh, 
bed straw, the one that you throw at somebody yeah. and it sticks to their shirt. Um, it, it's a winter annual. It's probably already germinated if you're not opposed to using chemicals. Um, a pre-emergent herbicide applied about the middle of September would should keep it from germinating in your garden. Um, it's probably too late now to um, apply a pre-emergent because most of your winter weeds are already germinated and happily growing. So this year, you're just going to have to pull it and try to pull it before it goes to seed. It's not hard to pull. And if you have uh, grandkids or, or children, uh, children or know somebody, the neighbor's kids, they might find it fun because it is like Velcro. You can show them that and you can encourage them to come along and pull it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. It, it's not um, a hard one to get out of the ground. No, I did pull a lot of it. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. I did pull a lot of it um, earlier in the year. And um, unfortunately, I, I guess I didn't get the roots. Um, it wasn't sowing seed then, but what I did get back to it later, I, it definitely was. So, and it's a large, large area. And it's just coming back into growth? Well, not now. No, it's dried up now. It's an annual. If, if we're talking about, if we are all talking about the same plant, uh, the winter annual bed straw or cleavers. Yep, that's it's it. It's true annual. So by the time it's matured its seed, the plant has died. A true annual dies after it completes its life cycle. Um, now, um, sweet woodruff is a gallium, or at least it used to be. Yeah. Nope, not that one. I've got okay. that too. No, this, this is gallium and it's dried. I have dried strings of it all over my plants. I yeah. would get rid of as much of it as you can because there's probably seeds hiding in that. And that'll limit you a little bit. And then, I hate to say it, just be persistent. Uh, yeah, the minute you touch it, though, it drops more seeds. So, yeah. You know, Yep. I don't know. Have a, I, a, a bucket to underneath it. <laughs> I, I had a patch so thick that I was able to roll it up like carpeting. Or yeah. <laughs> this past, uh, yes, uh, it mounds and covers part. everything. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I'm hoping I got mine early enough. Um, there we go. Um, Kathy has asked, will large allium perennialize? Is it uh, cold enough over the winter for them? Well, I'm not quite sure what she means by large allium. If you're talking about those glorious, huge flowered ones that are, on, are in all the bulb catalogs this time of year, most of them do not do well for us. If you want a, something approximating that plant, the uh, giant garlic or elephant garlic that you buy in the produce department, there is a similar thing. Um, that looks like an improved form of it called summer drummer that has done quite well at the Arboretum. It's probably fully six feet tall when that one blooms. At least. But most of those big alliums um, will either not bloom, not even bloom the first year. And if they bloom the first year, that's usually the only time they bloom. There are a few smaller ones that are quite good for us, but um, that might be another conversation. If you're <laughs> talking in head size, Allium Christophia, it only gets about a foot or so tall. That one is actually right behind me in the GFI border and it's naturalizing. Uh, it's one that's reliable. It, it, it's an open inflorescence, but it might be eight, 10 inches across. But it'll, again, it only gets about a foot, foot and a half tall at most. Cool, well, that sounds like the one to plant. Okay, Gwen said that she bought the Calicanthus Aphrodite at the auction, and she was thrilled about it, but she has a little concern about the brown speckled spots on the leaves. Maybe the area is too wet. Should she dig it up or any other recommendations? How long has it had the brown speckled leaves? This time of year, a lot of foliage gets uh, discolored just because it's dying away. They, they probably started about three or four weeks ago and they've kind of gotten a little bit worse and I, I'm brand new to this plant and just don't know what to expect. I, I built up the bed a little bit. I, I keep like digging around it and adding more good soil and I added some of that granular um, 
you're probably using I, permatil, stay like permatil. I, I would, yeah, the gravel you're using. Yes, yes, that's it. Tim, I, I'm thinking that this late in the year, I wouldn't worry about that kind of. Yeah, thing. I wouldn't worry about it till spring. It's okay. a deciduous okay. plant. It's just you know, <clears throat> at certain times, I mean, we lose. I think of plants losing their um, leaves as you know, we're always constantly shedding skin particles. You know, it's things are dying. It's normal. It's not an evergreen. Um, just like a human losing hair. <laughs> and and right. if, it is, if it is a foliar problem, you can remove the leaves as they fall to keep it from getting reinfected next year. And that might help a little bit. I haven't um, had any trouble with those getting having foliar issues. Uh, what I get is on the, the flowers on some of the um, calicanthus, especially uh, not Aphrodite, uh, sorry, Venus, which is a white flowered one. It gets speckles on it gets a fungal issue on the flowers when we have rain. Um, but uh, Aphrodite has been real good. So I think it's just the time of the year. Like, yeah. Doug, they're getting old, you know, late I'm in the season. I'm going for the best then. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, you'll be fine. Don't and worry it at this point. About, it at least doubled or maybe tripled in size. So it was growing. Um, yeah, but just Sounds fun. bad soil that I'm trying to work with that I, I'm always a little bit nervous. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And Ginny said that she had five Duke ewes in her um, in her yard by her front porch, and four of them died recently. A neighbor thought getting sod put in in the front yard may have changed the way the water drains and could have affected the wetness of the soil. Any thoughts of why her um, plants might have died and what she can do to improve what things? What are Duke ewes? Uh, there's a, there's a cultivar our, called Duke. Isn't there a separate oh, name? you're talking about Plataxis. Plum ewes. Yeah, that's plum yeah. yeah. And what happened to them? They died. Four out of five died. And her biggest change was that she had some sod put in the front yard. How, how long have they been planted? Jenny, can you speak up? I can now that I'm unmuted. <laughs> there you go. Um, it turned out that they had been there probably for about five years. And then we had the sod put in and all of a sudden things started changing and like the four of them died and the one, yeah, he's limping along, but I'm trying to figure out what else I can plant there. Did you put irrigation in too? Yeah. No. I'm wondering that. Is that no, no, no irrigation. Did you maybe keep the grass super wet? So the plum used drowned. Uh, well, yeah, I guess to get it going, we did have to have a lot of water pumped in, not pumped in, but um, put on it for a while. That might have had something to do with it. Yeah, Mark, Mark said that happened in his yard. I forget what plant it was, but he had sod put in, so he was watering on a daily basis to get it established, and there was a plant near it that was also getting hit, and it died. Ah, okay, that could have something and to do with it. What then. year was this? Uh, How long ago years. was the lawn? Two years ago was when we had the sod put in, and... It, two years ago, we had excessive rain. What's that? Two years ago, we had excessive rain. It was 2018. We yeah. had the record amount of rain here, at least in Raleigh. I'm, are you in Raleigh area? Apex. Or Apex, yeah. We've had... Yeah. I forget what the number was that year. It was like 15, 20 inches above normal, um, and we had a lot of root issues here in the garden and lost a lot of things as a result of that. So that wouldn't surprise me as well. Yeah, we also had a um, blood good maple, blood good, blood red, yeah. what is it? Blood. Yeah, blood good, good is a cultivar. Yeah, blood good. And it ended up getting some leaves from the bottom and then just nothing we happened at the top. So we ended up pulling that out. Yeah. And that may have been the same issue then. Yeah, it sounds like the, the the dynamics of the the environment there changed a bit, and it might have been exacerbated by. I'm thinking 2018 was really bad for us, like I said here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, we had some dry spells last year, which took them out then because the roots were compromised in 2018. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So Nancy said that the deer ate all of her flowers off of her La Peppermint Camellia. How could she prevent this from happening again? 
Get rid of the camellia. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably what Nancy wanted to hear. How about some of the... the um, trying to do uh, that, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I would, I would think a nicely timed deer repellent should make the plant uh, untasty for them to eat it. Uh, but deer have been known to eat the foliage of camellias as well. Um, we have one person, I'm not too sure if she's um, in today's program, that she's planted camellia. And she says they remain tasty to deer for two, maybe three years from the nursery. And then after that, the deer don't bother them. Um, but she has, that was the foliage, not necessarily the flowers, but a nicely timed deer repellent might be able to keep them from wanting to eat the flowers. What kind of deer Never repellent heard of the do you use? Uh, myself, I use liquid fence, which seems to uh, be water fast, so it doesn't wash off in the rain. But of course, the problem with any deer repellent that uh, even doesn't wash off is the plant then grows because it's not getting eaten by deer and any new growth is not going to have the deer repellent. So you got to remember to put it on. <laughs> that, that's where I get in trouble. Hey, thank you. Liquid fence is yeah, highly course. recommended by many people. So uh, I think I, I would go with liquid fence as well. It's readily I, I know what I'm... I know when I'm pouring it into the sprayer that <laughs> there's no way I would ever eat anything that that stuff touched. <laughs> it's it's pretty nasty. <laughs> um, I sprayed. Some I think of it's. Uh, I think it's. I sprayed some of that two days ago that, when people walking by went. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> and what, what's really weird about it is I, I think it I, I don't know if it kind of does something outside and interacts with the atmosphere or what but it seems to get worse I'm, I'm guessing it's just the evening when it gets uh, stiller outside because you can't open your windows after you put that stuff out in the yard oh, it's, it's, it's nasty but it's, it's usually gone within the next day so it's not too bad okay so Julia said that she had a borage plant with black leaves and she cut them off and it's doing fine now other sections of thyme and oregano um, in the area are turning black and dying, uh, uh, and part of the rosemary as well. Should she should she remove them or start over with new plants? What's the That's environment? Summit. I'm sorry. Go on, Tim. What's the environment? Is she watering them? Doesn't the, mess up, mess, mention watering, Tim. The environment like is called gardening in the south. Yep. Summer. In the summer is the crucial time. In summer, a lot of herbaceous plants rot. And you you remove the part that is rotted. And when the weather cools down in October or so, the plants will freshen up and look good again next spring. And we go through that again it come the following summer. I've, I've never grown a borage myself, but the, the thyme and the oregano and rosemary are Mediterranean kind of plants, and they enjoy kind of gravelly well-drained soils and it's not hot where they live and it doesn't rain all summer long like we had this year so we kind of had the opposite environment here for them so they're not the best of things uh, they usually grow well enough i've i've had ample rosemaries i've never really grown a thyme here in my yard but they're, they're certainly a plant that if it gets a little bit too wet can definitely um keel over in no time yeah we'll get major die out on patches of thyme in the summer whether hot or dry or wet or in hot, <laughs> they they can die either way. But um, depends on the the species sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I thought maybe the um, you start to think that the plant is suffering, so you water it, and then you overcompensate sometimes. I didn't think I had overwatered. Okay. Uh, if anything, I let things get plenty dry. That's it's good. In the sun. <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. The the normal rains that are not the normal, but the rains we had this summer were in part too much for some of those plants if, if it's not drained enough. And the uh, soil pathogen that causes the rotting of many herbaceous plants is a, a organism that's in all soils year mm -hmm. round, and, but it's a saprophyte just living on decaying material until the soil temperatures go over 70 degrees, and at that time it turns into a parasite and starts attacking living plant material. And that's when a lot of herbaceous plants rot in the summertime. It's what's called mustard seed fungus or southern blight. Um, 
you know, there's some plants like it's a hundred percent guaranteed that if you grow lambs, um, lambs ears, um, it's going to rot out in the summertime. And if you look around the base of the plant, you'll see the little fruiting bodies that are sort of a goldish tan colored about the size of mustard seed. And that's why it has that common name. But, um, you know, there's some herbaceous perennials that we give up growing because it's guaranteed they're going to rot in the summer and we just move on to things that are tolerant of, of, of the pathogen. Thank you. Sure. Marianne asked, is there a way to get rid of stink, uh, stink horn mushrooms? Oh, yeah, I'll take them home with me. They're just so fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I got to look that one up now. I, I've never heard of a stinkhorn. Uh, I've seen several recently in the, just the time of the year, I think. The, they're maturing oh, right cool. now. I don't know if they're a damaging species or not. I think they're probably a saprophyte and they just live in the soil, but the, I don't think they're a parasitic species, but I could be wrong. And, you know, we've had a lot of rain this fall and moisture brings out a lot of fungus. Yeah, this is the time of the year they harvest a lot of mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, you're just seeing the fruiting body. They're just very odiferous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so should you worry about mushrooms this time of year at all? I mean, I just keep kicking them out and pulling them out or tossing them aside. Yeah. Should you worry about it? I wouldn't even do that myself. As long as they're really not a parasitic species, I mean, most of the time, like I said, they're saprophytes and they're just living off of dead material. They're really good decomposers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're in association with um, with the trees and stuff in your yard uh, and they actually help things out. So um, other times not, but um, they're there. There's way more fungi than you really realize. Yeah, the, the mushrooms that we see are just a tiny part of the plant. Most of the plant is well, not even plant, but... aren't plants any longer. Um, it's the mushroom is just the reproductive part of the plant. You know, 99% of the plant are those mycelium, those little thread-like growths in the in the uh, in the duff layer and down in the soil or in a rotting log or something. Wow, that's fascinating. They are helping to break down all that detritus. Um, they make nutrients available to the plants themselves. Uh, so they're, like I said, they're not always a bad thing. Yeah, I think they're good. So here, here's a question I think Tim would be really good on, although I bet you Doug is too. Val says that she started some cyclamen coom from seed and have them in plastic cups outside. Should she plant them now or let them get bigger in the cup? I. We'll let you answer that How big one. are they? Val, you want to speak up how big they are? I'm guessing they're not too big if she just started them. Well, Tim, if she doesn't speak up, how long does it take you to plant one from seed and until it gets large enough? Uh, what, what are yours? I mean, I keep them in just in containers, but they don't always like to be in containers. Um, you could plant them out as long as you can keep track of them, basically. That's the, the key thing with me, but... Um, so if, they're, if they're big enough that you know where they are, then that's good enough. You could plant them out. They'd be happy and happy to be outside. Uh, coom, I can kill readily. If it self sows, I'm happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know, lamb, uh, that just comes up everywhere. Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. If Phil is already doing well with cyclamen coom in the ground, then I would definitely plant them and not hold them in pots because I agree with Tim, cyclamen can be difficult in pots. You can, you know, there's a very fine line between keeping them too wet or too dry in a pot. And in an earlier garden where I did really well with coom and you'd get these tight little clutches of seedlings, I would transplant even when they had just a single leaf and they would, you know, reestablish and come be, return next year even bigger. So I'd go ahead and plant them. Okay. And uh, Sam Val said that she started some Daphne from cuttings and seed. And should she be should she plant them now, even though they're small? I can kill a Daphne in a pot again. <laughs> yep. Are you but, talking uh, about suicide plant? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So better better off in the ground then, it sounds like. 
I, as long I as think you can so. keep track of them, that Daphne will probably be happier out in the garden. Okay. Um, Mary asked, uh, should a young coral bark Japanese maple have its narrow crotch branches pruned off? And if so, when? Um, go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say, I wouldn't prune it unless I had to. It's not a big tree. It's not like something that's going to become a majorly tall tree that's going to have uh, damage if, uh, or that is, it's not going to fall in your house. It's not like a, an oak. Um, but I'll let I agree you with you Tim. What? So I, I said they're pretty strong overall, too. So maybe a, a narrow crotch angle on the Japanese maple compared to a narrow one on a pear are a lot different in their strengths. And I think that cultivar tends to have a lot more, more narrow crotches than the typical Japanese maple. Is it Sangukaku? Well, they didn't specify, just said coral bark. Yeah. Probably Sangukaku. But I've also seen instances where the people growing maples cut them back hard periodically. So you have this huge flush of bright red twigs. And there was one of those was um, in a golf cor course I used to live near. And it was probably 500 feet away. But when the sun caught that plant, it, it just, you couldn't avoid seeing it. There were just so many brilliantly colored young twigs. That does not make for good structure, but it does make for a, a really glorious show in the garden. Thank you. Sure. Carolyn has asked, what's the best way to get rid of mugwort? Move? <laughs> yeah. If you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> it, uh, herbicides don't kill it. Yeah. Would some of that stuff that you put on stumps to kill them, would that work? Um, I it's don't know. It's really a glyphosate material. It, 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 I've used Roundup, but I don't know. Um, persistent digging of every little piece, if it's not an enormous area. Um, it totally took over my vegetable garden while I was gone this summer. Just <laughs> How big of an area? Uh, oh, about 10 by 20. Oh, wow. It's mugwort? I'd probably. What it's a, not solid mugwort at this point. I've been pulling, but you know. No, you'll never get rid of it. Uh, but I might try like covering the whole area with something like black plastic, but leave it down for maybe like two years or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sacrifice that spot for a few years. Oh, it's right in front of the house. That's not going to work. <laughs> Uh, a new concrete patio. <laughs> yeah, I'll put a patio over it now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you have grandkids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell them to run around. I don't know. No, I just uh, can pay them to dig it. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's a thought. <laughs> so I see in the chat that Dennis has the photographs from Garish. Do you want to go ahead and just load them up, Dennis? You can actually share them on your screen for us. Um, I do see them on mine on a different computer. That's probably one of those plants that we may not know. At least I don't know. <laughs> Let's see if we uh, can. Yeah, give me a second. Out. I just emailed it out. I didn't uh, oh. I don't have them up right now. Oh, okay. Okay, so you emailed it to me? Yeah. Give me a minute. I'll see if I can find it. While he's doing that, Doug. Kathy's asked, can you recommend a pink flowering crepe myrtle, not rose colored, looking for a green leaf type? Would appreciate a uh, vase as well of, as rounder head variety and looking for good suggestions. Well, I'm always uncomfortable when people are asking for a specific color because what you're calling pink might not be what I call pink. I see somebody um, recommended um, Pink velour crepe myrtle, it's it's a gorgeous thing. It's more of a magenta color, sort of a darker version of that. Um, so no, off the top of my head, I don't know one to recommend. Um, sorry about that. Hmm. 
I'm having trouble unzipping this, Dennis. Oh, really? Uh, the e email I sent should it just be a link to a um, yeah. Google, Google Drive. I have them up. Um, I'll share my screen. Okay. One, one well, while y'all are doing that, I may have to sign off soon, but I just wanted to tell y'all um, this was a lot of fun, very informative, and you can tell Mark that y'all did a much better job than he does. Ha -ha. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, Cut yeah. the piece out really in the video good. and we'll share it with them. <laughs> all over the place, but really good um, information. So thank y'all for sharing. So much fun. Glad you're thank enjoying you. it. So Tim and Dennis looks like, uh, I'm sorry, Tim and Doug looks like Dennis is sharing it. You got any idea? No, I can see it. Can you show is me the other picture? Is it Salvia pictures? Farinacea? No. I think so. It doesn't look like Salvia Farinacea, no. Yeah, here's another photo. Oh, it's it's oh. it's asteraceae. Yeah. Uh, so it's it might in the group that includes it used to be eupatoriums. Oh, yeah. That picture's upside down, so I'm standing on my head now. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Good. Can we? Are there other photos? The three. It this might be. Photo. Um. I wonder if it's at. Do we know where it's at? I wonder if it's Baccarus. No. It doesn't look like Baccarus. No. Uh, where is this located? Do we know that where the person lives? Uh, that would be a question for Girish. Uh, uh, Girish did not share any details with me other than the photos. Yeah. Did he, did he say something about it being a weed that was taking over his garden or something? Is it's he still a he just, just wants an ID on. Let me see. Uh, we might just, we'll work on it some other time when we're not in the Zoom. Yeah, yeah I wonder if it's an Adgeratina, but not 100% certain. Okay. Well, if we're going to answer that one later, the next thing that I see in the chat might be a good segue to concluding the program so we don't keep everyone going for too long. Linda asked, is Tim going to show us something in the garden? So we do have some plant samples that Tim and Doug have for a little bit of show and tell. You want to go ahead and show those? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, we've You've seen the crocus and the uh, snowdrop, people see these this time of year and think, oh my God, global warming has really messed up everything. But no, <laughs> October is when snowdrops and crocus start. Obviously, these aren't the same species that you see in the spring. But um, from this point into March, there are various different species of snowdrops and crocus blooming. The snowdrop is one name for Queen Olga of Turkey, or maybe it's Greece, uh, with Galanthus, the snowdrops are Galanthus. This is Galanthus regine olgae. And this time of year when it blooms, it doesn't have foliage, but it'll put up its foliage and have foliage all winter. It is very fragrant. I'll hold it close to the computer so you can sniff it. I didn't know that. I need to go smell them then. Yeah, it's very fragrant. And this crocus is crocus speciosus, speciosus meaning showy. And they've closed up in here away from the sunshine, quite a blue violet inside. And it'll bloom for the whole month of October. Um, it's rather tall um, and they tend to flop over. So it's nice to plant them through a low ground cover like a sedum or uh, the common leadwort. Um, the little hurricane lily or schoolhouse lily or oxblood lily, Rhodophiala bifida, it's about done blooming. This was a light scape and the flowers a little bit smaller than normal. Of course, um, October is also when many cyclamens start. I have three different cyclamen here. They're very similar in bloom, but they're different in growth habit and foliage. This is lion's paw. Um, Leonotus, Leonorus. It's it's not always reliably winter hardy here, but um, a lot of winters it'll come through the winter. Uh, it's a lot like a Monarda, and it's in the same family as Monarda, the gigantic mint family. Um, it's at its peak in uh, September and October. 
Um, uh, fall is a great time for fruit display in the garden. Uh, this is the um, Mexican counterpart to our native blue uh, beautyberry. Our native beautyberry is Calicarpa maricana. This is Calicarpa. Um, my mind just acuminata. Acuminata. Um, the fruit are almost black, a very dark sort of mulberry purple. Um, other than Calicarpa maricana and that Mexican species I just sh showed you, there aren't, I don't think there are any other North American Calicarpa, um, but there are almost endless numbers of Asian Calicarpas, beauty berries. And this is one I especially like. This is Magno Magnolia, Calicarpa rubella, um, great big fuzzy leaves. One thing I really like about it is a lot of the beauty berry fruit disappear once we've had a hard frost. They brown and shrivel up. But this one in past winters has remained colorful all winter. It's a fairly large plant, about nine, at least nine feet tall. Oh. And do you want me to um, let you show a few things? Yeah, you showed some of mine. That's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. We Actually, didn't show that salvia, the salvia. Um, okay. Yeah. El Boitano. Because yours is yeah. better color. Uh, this is a really cool sage that's just, just popped open in the last week or so. It'll flower until frost now. Um, it it has the buds are really tight in what looks like an involucre or these bracts. Um, yeah, it is before an they involucre. open. Yeah. And you can see them there on the sides on uh, that one that Doug has. And then they open up to these really beautiful um, deep pink um, fuzzy uh, florets on a spike and it'll, like i said it'll flower till frost now and it's on a large plant um uh, probably about six sometimes even seven or eight feet tall but at least yeah. six feet tall uh, wow. so it needs a little it's bit of space to, it's a, pardon salvia involucrata el boitano it's salvia puberula oh puberula thank you yeah puberula and involucrata are very similar yeah. similar species and I was trying to remember the name earlier. And so that's yeah, and what came up. Puberula but, uh, yeah. is referring to the hairs. Um, on okay, the, yes. Real Pubescent. fuzzy. Fuzzy. Yeah. Uh, and let's see, Doug already showed, you had a camellia. The, did you get autumn rose, a rose of autumn? Yeah. So it, your color will be better it. too. Yeah, this you can is, talk about it. This is, Doug's a camellia expert, but uh, no. I don't know, just, when I planted this when it's behind the necessary, it's in the shade and it's always covered, I think in tons of flowers and ducks is, if you had really planted that in the shade, it would have so many more flowers. And I'm thinking, okay, the poor thing. Oh, in the sun. But this is just getting started. It literally has hundreds of, and hundreds of buds on it now, but this is a really um, dependable cultivar. It's a uh, Camellia Hymalis, Rose of Autumn. Um, and it's it's a it's a really good one for us here, uh, and I've really enjoyed it the last several years. Um, a couple other things I do have in my vase that, Mar uh, that Doug didn't have: uh, the the um, Farfusium are beginning to flower, uh, Farfusium japonicum, Ariomaculatum. It looks like it's a uh, viral leaf spot on it, but nope, that's normal for this. Uh, the flowers are coming out on this uh, right now. Um, beautiful yellow daisies, and it, it's a part shade plant. Um, it can take it relatively, mm. uh, not dry, but well, um, well drained, and it's it's content typically in our summers. Uh, but then in this fall, you get uh, wonderful flowers. Uh, another sage that's going in our lath house right now. Uh, this is Salvia um, Neponicum, uh, variety Formosanum. Uh, it's one of the woodland sages. It flowers October and November uh, until frost for us here. This is some that actually Mark collected the seeds for, uh, or from uh, uh, Taiwan, hence variety Formosana. Uh, I don't remember which year now, but um, it's spectacular right now in our lath house. It's only about 10 to 12 inches tall, but the clump that it has formed now is about five or six feet wide. It's just a low uh, mounding plant. Um, this one does not like, it probably won't show up real well, but we'll see what happens. Um, this is one of the hardy impatience. 
This is a patient, uh, I'm gonna say Omiana, though it's probably Omiensis or something like that. It's uh, one of the, uh, a rhizominous in patient. Uh, you may have gotten another cultivar of this if you, um, in some of the bags that we gave away a few weeks ago in the giveaway, and it may look dead in there. They hate to be in pots, um, but the pots are often full of rhizomes if you look, in, look at them. And they don't like our summer here, so they often go summer dormant. They've uh, flushed up and are in full growth right now. The foliage on this one is a silver uh, cast one, uh, but you're starting to get the yellow flowers on it now, pastel yellow flowers. And again, those will go to frost for us. Um, just a really cool one. And whenever I had to shut down earlier, I lost my photos that I had open. So I don't have any photos to share for you right now, but. Well, I have a few plants. See if I can show these off at all. These are from the conifer grafting workshop that we did earlier this this year. Yeah, geez, <laughs> I think January. we did. I think no, I think we did this in March, Tim. I think we did oh, this March right before the shutdown. March. So this was a program that we hosted here at the Arboretum. It was uh, with Leanne, um, one of our um, uh, staff members, who's. Um, uh, off offer or who's a uh, grafting expert and does a really good job but this is one that i did so this is the um meta sequoia this is the uh, sherman's and nordlick which is sometimes just listed as northern lights that's the compact one that's outside the japanese garden everything that you're seeing here was um new growth from the uh, little scion wood that i attached to the uh, rootstock so i'm i'm very happy about that I think it looks great and with this one two out of three took which i thought was really good results we also did ginkgo, and this is troll, which is a, a little tiny cult of our collection. And this one gets two-ish, three-ish feet tall and wide, although I'm sure here in the south it can do uh, get a little bit bigger than that. And uh, everything you're seeing on here is all new growth from the uh, the scion that I attached to the plant. And out of this one, I have three out of three that were successful. And according to Leanne, ginkgo are a really good training plant because they're super duper easy to do. And based upon those results, she's very accurate. And my last one, which I unfortunately only got one of one, is my Taxodium, and this was Cascade Falls. So this is one of the weeping ones that we have, and Cascade Falls has no upright growth. So if you want to get to a certain height, you got to stake it up to that height, and then it's just going to cascade from that location. And I think, Tim and Doug, isn't this the one that's uh, on the main path where they all intersect kind of outside the Japanese yeah. garden? Yeah ish area uh really really fun cultivar i can remember when we first took this out to a trade show because that's when we first got it and this was boy over 15 years ago we actually broke one of two stems on it on the way back <laughs> so it, it turned out pretty good and we had a good good result from the workshop so overall i got what two-thirds success out of that workshop and have some pretty cool plants that i get to put in the landscape now so that was a lot of fun hope you can join us at a future propagation workshop has were some pretty these, good results. Were these grafted onto something? A rootstock? Yeah. So the ginkgo was grafted grafted on a ginkgo rootstock. The meta sequoia was grafted onto plain meta sequoia, and the uh, taxodium was grafted on the plain taxodium or bald cypress. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, we we actually bought the liners in and had them ready to go for the um, for the workshop. And I think it was Tim and maybe Cindy collected the sand wood for the yep. workshop. And they're all bundled up in little bags. And we learned how to graft the plants. It was a lot of fun. So I think that's what we have for everyone. It's getting a little bit late. We've already gone over by about 21 minutes. We certainly had oodles of questions. I saw that Dennis was definitely uh, going through them and asking a lot of them in the chat. So I hope that we were able to get through at least most of them. It looks like this was a pretty popular program. We had about 80 people in here from most the entire program. So maybe we'll offer this one again. I know yeah, I have. Yeah, this was great. Uh, thank, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. And thanks to Tim and Doug and Dennis and the rest of the staff to help answer questions. We appreciate your help and we appreciate you joining us. Have a great week. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. This was wonderful. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Linda. It was something different, wasn't it? Yes, it was good. I, I learned a lot. Hope everyone can join us next week with the rebranded Midweek with Bryce. <laughs> Looks like Arlene's clapping. Yay. Great job, <laughs> this was our, everyone. This was Arlene, by the way. So thank, thanks to Arlene for a good suggestion. Thanks,
Thanks a lot. Well executed. Much appreciated. <laughs>